All praises be to the Most High. The Shia of Shah, the Shia, the Haya, the Haya, the Shah, the Haya. We thank His wonderful Son, the Shia, the Christ, and we give praise to the Holy Spirit, Ruach, for coming in and being a part of this glorious Sabbath. Interesting topic that we're going to talk about today. The veil. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people in Christianity don't even know what the veil represents. It's pretty sad. But you know what? Father has given us the, the capabilities to, to, to bring this teaching. And I pray that it's a blessing to, to everyone. Because it blessed me when I was born through it. All right, so, of course, our media, the email, the YouTube, um, services every Sabbath, and we're going out next Sabbath to street preach. Okay? That's next Sabbath. Year of Jubilee. We're going to have a teaching on the year of Jubilee. Uh, Christ the Healer. We're going to talk about all the healings that Christ did. Why did he do it? Why do we should be doing it today? Um, evils in America. That's just America's the new and improved Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. And of course, with every holiday that come up, we have to expose it. Valentine's Day. It's going. We're going to expose Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a little R-rated, but you know what? We're going to expose it anyway for the pagan holiday that it is. So these are upcoming. Okay. Our next feast day, February 14th, is the Feast of Cure. A lot of people are saying February 20, whatever, but in the Bible, it says um, that the 14th day of the month of Adar, I believe, which is February. So that's the Feast of Pura. During the feast, we're going to do, of course, like we did with, I forgot which one it was. The, the, the trumpets. trumpets. Same thing. Everything that's done here on Earth, is mimicked in heaven. So they're having the Feast of Purim in heaven on February 14th. So that's what we're going to be doing also. Okay? But the veil, the, the ripping of the veil, whatever you want to call it. Let's get uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 10. If I can have somebody read that. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit like him, like a dove, descending or descending upon him. So, baptism. Started off with the baptism. The heavens open. The heavens rent open when Christ was baptized, and the Holy Spirit like a dove descended upon him. So in the Bible, you have to have a beginning and you have to have an end. This was the beginning. This is kind of like the veil being rent open. If you don't know what I mean when I say the veil, we'll explain that a little later. Okay. So there's a picture. The Sadducees was in the temple. Christ was on the cross and the veil started to rain. What's behind that veil? I'll tell you that in a moment. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. So the praise of the glory of His grace. 
Every one of us is accepted. Every one of us is accepted. Okay? And we're beloved. That's what Father feels of us, being accepted and we're beloved. In the inner court of the temple was Jerusalem. In the holy, in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That there was a high priest who would go once a year to offer atonement for the sins of the people. The veil was a very thick woven curtain separated the holies of holies from the rest of the temple. So, in Solomon's temple, you had the holies of holies, you had the veil, and you had the, north, the place where they did the sacrifices and all that, the outer court. No one was allowed past that veil. No one. But the high priest. And once a year, he was only allowed there once a year to go in and offer atonement for the sins of the people. Okay? We don't have to do that anymore. All right? Just to give a little brief history. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 to 52. Want to pay attention to the next few scriptures because this is what <coughs> renting of the veil is. Go ahead. Matthew 27, 50. Yeshia, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Mm -hmm. Verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So here Matthew is giving an account of when Christ was on the cross. He's telling that Yeshua, when he gave up the ghost with a loud voice. And the temp at that moment, as soon as he gave up the ghost, the temple, the veil was wrecked. It was torn in two. Then there was the earthquake that started, that happened when Christ died on the cross. Okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke give an account of these. So it must be important in three of the four Gospels. We know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written for different people. The Gospel of John was pretty much written for everybody. Yes. Matthew was written for the Jews. Luke was written for the Greeks. Mark was written for the Romans. Romans. Wait. You said Matthew for the Jews? Matthew was for the Jews. Luke for the Greeks. Luke was for the Greeks. And Mark was for the Romans. John was for everybody. Okay. Verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent. Very key. You don't want to gloss that over. Let's look at the account in the book of Mark. And Yeshua cried out cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent and twain from the top to the bottom. When the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he cried, that he so cried out and gave him up the ghost, he said, truly this man is the son of the Most High. There you go. So again, another account, pretty much the same thing. Yeshia cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost, meaning he died. Okay? The veil then was rent. The first thing that he mentions after Christ dies is the veil being rent, being torn. Then the centurion, who's, um, the centurion was that same centurion who um, Christ had healed of his servant stood and he said, truly, this was the Son of the Most High. Okay? But follow that. Immediately after he gave up the voice, the, the ghost, the very next thing was that the temple was, the veil of the temple was rent. Let's give Luke's account 
Luke chapter 23, verse 44 through 47. And it was that about the sixth hour, there was a darkness of all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Yeshua had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion was, saw what was done, he glorified the Most High, saying, Certainly this was a right, righteous man. <coughs> righteous man. Again, the Shai gives up the ghost, the very first thing, the veil of the temple was rent. It's very key. On this veil. And why was the veil rent? First we have to know what the veil was, right? Let's get Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which he hath complicated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. He was ripped, the veil was ripped. Okay? Through the blood is what is redeemed us of our sins. Something a little more deeper about the veil. The veil was torn, the Shia is now our intercessor. We don't have to go through a person to reach the Most High anymore. We don't have to go through rituals anymore. Instead, the Shia made a new and an easy way for us to reach the Most High. The Shia paid for it all. And that is what is important to remember. So, let's talk about the description of the veil. It wasn't some little curtain. Okay. Solomon's temple was about 30 cubits high. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 2 in a moment. But Herod had increased its height to 40 cubits. According to the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, there is uncertainty to the exact measurement of a cubit, but it's safe to assume that the veil was somewhere near 60 feet tall. Wow. Josephus also tells us that the veil was four inches thick, and that horses tied to each side could not pull the veil apart. That's pretty strong. It was four inches thick, so it was thicker than pretty much the length of a hand. That's how thick it was. The book of Exodus teaches that this thick veil was fashioned from blue, purple, and scarlet material with fine twisted linen. 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 We're going to go there in a moment, too. But first, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 2. 1 Kings. 6 verse 2, and the house which King Solomon built the most high Ahiah, the length thereof was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. So that's about 60 feet. That's pretty big. That's pretty wide. It was about 30 feet in width and 60 feet in height. That's how big it was. Uh, that's just a picture. That's probably what happened after the veil was ripped. Because on the opposite side of the veil was the Holy of Holies, which nobody was allowed to go in but the high priest. If anyone went in there, they were dead. Instantly, inside the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And only the Levites. Only the Levite high priest could go in, and he could only go in once a year. They had a cord wrapped around them when he would go in to make sure that he didn't die. If they would tell him to make sure that, you know, if he did die, okay, we just can pull him out, because ain't nobody going to go in there and die after him. Right? <laughs> That's also in the book of Exodus. Josephus 
in the War of the Jews, chapter 5, paragraph 4, verse pages 480, I mean 847. The book, this is in the book of Josephus. The book, Josephus has several books in one book. The book is The War of the Jews. It's chapter 7, paragraph 4, page 847. I have a question. Because um, mm -hmm. I think that library still is it having like King James? You said what? The that Book of Josephus? Yeah. The Book of Josephus doesn't have a version. No. No. There is no King James version of the Book oh, of Josephus. That's what I was asking. Yeah, no. There's no, in fact, we <laughs> like have one in right there. I'll show it to you. I don't think it's King James. No. The Book of Josephus is just, it's a, it's, it's a version. It's not a. <laughs> it's not a version or a Bible or anything. It's a book that Josephus, one of our brothers, read, wrote back then. And of course, they're trying to make it seem like he was a Caucasian, which he was not. He was actually paid to keep right. records. The Romans right. paid him to keep the records. Right. Okay. But he was one of our brothers. Yeah. Um, I'll bring it out after the teach. Okay. <coughs> well, let's go there. It was... Its first gate was 70 cubits high and 25 cubits broad, but this gate had no doors, for it represented the universal visibility of heaven. So the whole, the whole way the temp, Solomon's temple was constructed was supposed to be constructed in the way of how it is in heaven. Okay? And that, it could not be excluded from any place. Its front was covered with gold all over, and through its first part of the house that was more inward did all of it appear, which it was very large. So did all the parts about the more inward gate appear to shine to those that saw them. But then as the entire house was divided into two parts within, that it was only the first part of it that was open to our view. So the first part was open, that's where the, everybody can go in, and not everybody, pretty much the Levite priests can go in. The second part was the Holy of Holies. You had the veil, on the opposite side of the veil, you had the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And the Ark of the Covenant is a teaching in itself. The contents that were in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant itself, how was it made, why was it made, that's an entire teaching unto itself, which we'll do eventually. Its height extended all along 90 cubits in height, and its length was 50 cubits, and its breadth 20. But, at, but the gate, which was at this end of the first part of the house was, as we already observed, all over covered with gold, as, it, as was its whole wall about it. it. It had also golden vines above it, which, from which its clusters of grapes hung as tall as a man's height. Okay, so these are the clusters that you see, the grapes, they were huge. They were pretty big. But then, and that's not known. That's not known about the about Solomon's temple. Were they real grapes? No, they were covered with gold. Oh. Golden oh, vines. Golden vines, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but then, uh -huh. but then this house as it was divided into two parts. The inner part was the lower than the appearance of the outer. And the golden doors about 55 cubits altitude and 16 in breadth. But before these doors, there was a veil equal in largeness with the doors. That's the veil. Okay. So you can imagine what this, what Solomon's <laughs> temple looked like. 
It was a Babylonian curtain embroidered with blue and fine linen and scarlet and purple. And the contrast, the contrast that was truly wonderful. Nor was this mixture of colors without its mystical interpretation, but was a kind of image of the universe, for by the scarlet there seemed to be an enigmatic, enigmatic something, I can't remember that, enigmatic something, signified fire. By the flat, fine flax of the by by the fine flax the earth, by the blue in the air, and by the purple of the sea. So the colors of the veil represented something of the earth itself. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter three verse fourteen. Go ahead. <coughs> And he made the veil of blue, and the purple, and the crimson, and the fine linen, and he brought cherubim's theorem. So cherubims are angels, as we all know. Okay? Powerful angels. Okay? So this here, contra this here goes with what Joseph is saying. That the veil was blue, purple, crimson, and fine linen and raw cherubims thereof. Right? Exodus chapter 26, verse 31 to 35. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine, fine linen of cunning work. The cherubim shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shit. Should I'm more over <laughs> overlaid with gold, their hook shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the touches that thou mayest bring in hither with the veil of with the veil of the ark. For the testimony and the veil shall divide or divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. All right there. Verse 33 is very key. And thou shalt hang upon and thou shalt hang up the veil under the taches, and thou mayest bring in hither within the veil of the ark of the testimony, which is the ark of the covenant, and the veil shall divide unto you. The veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So the veil is basically saying right there that you can't go past the veil. It's a division. It's too holy for you to enter. <coughs> also, the mercy seat was in there. Go ahead, Luke 34. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. So we weren't allowed in the holies of holies. The, only the high priest was allowed in the holies of holies. You had the mercy seat, you had the ark of the covenant, and the holy of holies. Mimicking heaven. Mimicking father's throne in heaven. Certain angels in heaven just can't go into the presence of the Most High. They just they can't. You said the Holy of Holies was in the temple? Yes, the Holy of Holies is in the temple. Oh, so the, Holy of, the Holies of Holies is the section that no one was allowed in. Only the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy okay. Seat was in the Holy of Holies. The High Priest would go in once a year. Okay? That just, that just lets you know that the Most High was playing. That's right. Like, how powerful it really is. Mm -hmm. Within the holy place of the tabernacle, there was an inner room called the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. From its name, we can see that it was, a, it was the most sacred room, a place no ordinary person could enter. This was the Most High's special dwelling place in the midst of his people. 
During the Israelites' wanderings in the wilderness, the Most High appeared as a pillar of cloud or fire and, and above the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a perfect cube in its length, width, and height, and it was all equal to 15 feet. That was when they were in the wilderness. Okay. A thick curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. This curtain was known as the veil. It was made of fine linen, purple, blue purple, scarlet yarn. There were figures of cherubim embroidered unto it. Cherubim spirits who served the Most High were, were in the presence of the Most High to demonstrate His almighty power and majesty. They also guarded the throne of the Most High. Cherub, like we said when we did the teaching on angels, cherubims are very angels are very serious beings, very serious entities. Not the angels that we see today on television. Not those angels that are given a job by the Most High to do it, and they do it. To the left. Angels, cherubims are very serious. There's a cherubim guarding what right now? Who remembers? The Garden of Eden. Not the Garden of Eden, but what's mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden? The tree. The tree. The tree. The tree. Uh, life. Life. Good evil. Right. There's a big cherubim guarding that tree right now. Right, not the other one. <laughs> but there's a big cherubim guarding that tree right now. That tree won't be released until when? Sakah? No. <laughs> Is that Hebrew? No. Uh, yeah. When will the tree of life be offered for us? When every when when Jerusalem comes down. When Jerusalem comes down and stuff the evil and the, 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 the tree of the tree of life will be available to us after the after Satan has been cast into. The lake of fire. The lake of fire, and everybody else who's associated with Satan is cast into the lake of fire. That's when the cherubim won't have to guard it anymore. Uh, if anyone looked upon it, they would see the cherubim figures. That's a warning. Okay? I better not go in there. You got these two big cherubims standing right there. I better not go in there. It's a warning. What if I can like this? Maybe I'll get a cherubim for our refrigerator. <laughs> the word veil in Hebrew means a screen, divider, or separate that separated that hides. So, what is this curtain hiding? Essentially, it's hiding the most high from sinful man. Whoever entered into the Holy of Holies was entering in the very presence of the Most High. And like I said earlier, only the high priest was allowed to go there. And the high priest, even the high priest, the Most High's chosen media with his people could only pass through the veil and enter the sacred dwelling once a year and that's where we get the Day of Atonement. What the high priest had to do is he had to make an atonement for himself and his family first. Because if he went in there without doing that first, he would die. Right. So he had to make an atonement for himself and his family and will sprinkle the blood. We'll get into that when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. The picture of the veil was that of the barrier between man and the Most High, assuring man that the holiness of the Most High could not be trifled with. The Most High eyes were too pure to look on evil, and he can tolerate no sin. So let's get Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Go ahead. Thou art the pure of a pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look into iniquity. 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 
whereof lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. So what is that saying? Let's say the most high has pure eyes. And he can't look on evil. He can't look on iniquity. <clears throat> Therefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and that holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour. The man is more that is more righteous than he. So basically said. Can man be more righteous than the Most High? No. No, because the Most High's eyes are pure. Ours are not. See, Scripture is very easy. It's um, knowing that Most High good, man bad. All right. So we talked about that part. Let's go to the Old Covenant. Okay. All this is a part of the veil. Let's get Exodus chapter 19 verse 5. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then you shall be a particular treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. So that's the covenant that we have with the Most High. Obey me. Keep my covenant. You'll be a peculiar people or a peculiar treasure. And unto me above all people. So the Most High is telling us that we're above all people right there. For all the earth is His. So if all the earth is His, then all the earth belongs to who? The tribes. tribes. Oh, okay. If we obey. If we keep his covenant. He says that we're peculiar. Look at some people in Judah. They're peculiar. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Dad, peculiar. Mm -hmm. Issachar, peculiar. Mm -hmm. Naphtali, peculiar. A little more peculiar. Asher. Peculiar. Levites. Oh, yeah. Very peculiar. They're a peculiar people. But we are above all other people. In the most highest eyes. Now that don't mean that you go start throwing your head around quoting this scripture to Caucasians. I'm begging you, Caucasian man. No. That's not what we do. You old Edomite? And then you get the person. You what just call you? me a dog? What, what, what's up here? What do you mean what? No. That's not the thing. Over 200 years of bondage in a pagan nation, the Israelites did not understand the Most High. Soon they returned to idol worship. From Mount Sinai, the Most High gave them a set of laws to help them learn how to live on lives. Those seven laws are the Ten Commandments. Okay? Exodus 30, 10. Exodus 30, 10. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin, offering of the atonements. Once in the year shall he make an atonement upon it. Throughout your generations, it is by the most holy unto the most high of So that's it. I didn't make it up where Aaron, where the high priest walked in once a year. I didn't make that up. It's right there. Mm -hmm. And we do that on the Day of Atonement, which was right after the Feast of Trumpets. One day we fast. Okay? Yeah. The first thing that Israel did was build a golden calf, breaking the first commandment. The law reveals our sins but cannot empower us to be obedient and righteous. So the law, it tells us what our sin is about. But the law can't make us be obedient. 
Father can't make us be obedient. We have to follow and be obedient. Okay? Or else we're going to be following, we're going to be building that same golden calf again. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the most high and higher, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So that's what the most high is saying. This is the old covenant now. Okay? He put his law in their inward parts, writing in their hearts. Still part of that covenant is today. Okay? But this is the old. This is pre-renting of the veil. Veil. The high priest had a sense of communion with the Most High. He was not only near, but he spoke with the Most High. I don't know, don't know what he said, but I would think that on that special day, the priest unburdened himself of all the loads of Israel's sin and sorrow and made known his request unto the Most High. Aaron, standing there alone, must feel, be filled with memories of his own faultiness and of the idolatries and the backslidings of the people. So the high priest had a heavy load on him. A heavy load on him. <coughs> right? And then, of course, we're human ourselves. So the presence of the Most High remained shielded for man behind a thick curtain during the history of Israel. However, the shyest sacrificial death on the cross changed that. When he died, the curtain in the Jerusalem temple was torn in half from top to bottom. Only the Most High could have carried out such an incredible feat because the veil was too high for human hands to have reached it, too thick to have torn it. So as we talk about, the veil was very tall, 60 feet in height, 30 feet in width, and it was 4 inches thick. No human could have done that. No human could have just reached up and tore it, ripped it. They even said that horses weren't even strong enough to pull it apart. That's how strong it was. There's another picture. That poor guy probably don't even know what's happening. Earthquakes and everything started to happen the day, the time when the Shia gave up the ghost. Let's go to Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, verse 1, verse 2. Behold, the Most High is not shortened, that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and the Most High, Ahiah, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. There you go. You sin, you won't hear your prayers. Yes. Was this prophesied by any of the prophets before? What, the renting of the veil? Yeah. Um, Isaiah and Jeremiah, I know for sure. Ezekiel, maybe, but I didn't come across anything from Ezekiel. Now there's the new covenant. Talk briefly about the old covenant. And now there's a new covenant. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. New covenant. House of Israel, which is the ten tribes from the lighter, the lighter-skinned tribes, and the house of Judah, which is Benjamin, Judah, and some Levi. Right, because some Levi were in the north. Okay? So he'll make a new covenant. How is he going to make this new covenant? Let's go to 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 30. But the Apocrypha. 2 Maccabees 6, verse 30. But when he was ready to die with stripes, he groaned and said, 
it is manifested to the Most High higher than the holy knowledge. That whereas I might have been delivered from death, I now endure sore pains in body, being beaten. But in soul I am well content to suffer these things because I fear Him. So if Christ, if you shy at the Most High, should we? Yes. He was ready to die with stripes. His body was in thorn sore pains. We were, there's going to be a teaching coming very soon about what Christ's body, what happened to his body on the cross. What was shutting down his vitals. We want to really go into that. Coming soon. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, Yeshua. Nevertheless, I live. Ye not, but Christ, Yeshua, liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of the Most High, Height, who loved me and gave himself for me. There you go. I live by the faith. Still talking about renting of the veil. Okay. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Yeshua, he who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So right here Paul is stating that we were far off. But since Christ died on the cross, we're now made nigh. That means we're together by the blood of Christ. So what that's basically stating is that when Christ gave up the ghost, rented the veil, now we don't have to have a high priest go into the holies of holies once a year. We can go into the holies of holies several times a day if we choose to. First, think of what has been done, an actual historical fact of the glorious veil which of the temple had been rent from twain from top to bottom as a matter of spiritual fact which is far more important to us. The separating legal ordinances is abolished. There was under the law of this ordinance that no man should ever go into the Holy of of, of all, but once an exception of the high priest, but he and he but once a year, and not without blood. If any man attempted to enter there, he must have died, as guilty of great presumption of a profane intrusion into the secret place of the Most High. Who can stand in the presence of him who is consuming fire? Mm -hmm. That's actually scripture in First Thessalonians, I believe. But he can, who can? Ephesians 2.18. For for him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. There you go, this is the new covenant. Through, for through him. We both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So we don't have to have a priest go in for us anymore because the Shire ripped the veil. Okay? The renting of the veil signified also the removal of the separating sin. Sin is, after all, a great divider between the Most High and man, that the veil of the blue and purple and fine twine man could, could not really separate man from the Most High. For he is, as to his omnipresence, not far from any one of us. Sin is a far more effective wall of separation. So basically, sin is... It does more than what the veil did. Sin keeps you away from the Most High, period. Okay? Also, the veil signified, like, 
how powerful the most high in the spirit is. Right. Pretty much that's what that's what like it's like a, um the veil it's like a symbol. Mm -hmm. of, like the power of the most high, right? Right. Is that what the teaching is about? Mm -hmm. Pretty much showing Christ mm -hmm. is so powerful that it split the veil in half. Correct. That's it. If I can sum it up. John chapter 14, verse 6. Shia said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now we get a better explanation of what this scripture means. Yeshua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now you get a better understanding on what this scripture means because now you have an understanding about the, the renting of the veil. That's what Christ was, was prophesying about when he said this. He was the one who, by giving up the ghost, renting the veil, making it easier for us to come into the Father. That's why he said that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. It has nothing to do with repenting and giving your life to Christ and all that. Nothing to do with that. It's about him renting the veil so that there is a dialogue between us and God. So, what do we make of this? What significance does this torn veil have for us today? Above all, tearing the veil at the moment of the shyest death dramatically symbolized that his sacrifice of shedding his own blood was a sufficient atonement for sin. Because the veil was there from the time it was created in the Exodus up until Yeshua gave up the ghost on the cross. The veil was unmoved. How many sacrifices were done? Thousands. And the veil was still there. Why? Because there wasn't a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice worthy enough to move, remove the veil until Christ came on the scene. Now we getting it? And once again, for all people, Jew and Gentile, not just the Hebrews. When Yeshua died, the veil was torn, the Most High moved out of that place, never again to dwell in the temple made by hands. So the Most High moved out of there. The Spirit of the Most High moved out of the temple. There was no need for him to be bound up in that temple when the high priest would come in once a year. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. The Most High made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Well, we all know that the book of Acts was written after Christ's death. So the Most High is no longer in that temple anymore. That's another thing that Christ did on the cross that is very rarely mentioned. So they still had it where they call it the welling wall as part of the temple, and people still go there and be bowing. And it says he's not there anymore. He's not there. They're bowing to a wall. That's pretty much what they're doing. They're just bowing to a regular. This wall right here is just could be as sacred as the Wailing Wall. So after service, everybody's going to stand up and we're going to be doing this to the oh, wall. Oh, no, thank you. Right? <laughs> Without hitting our head on the wall, just like they do over there. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. The Most High is not here. That's some kind of demon. It's an idol too. It's an idol too. Yeah. He's not here. Mm -hmm. Those priests didn't read Acts 17, 24, or else they'll stop it. Mm -hmm. It's the Jews who's doing it. So, Christ giving up the ghost, renting the veil. He 
said, I entrust my spirit into your hands. The Most High was through with, the, with that temple and the religious system. And the temple and Jerusalem was not desolate. Remember, the Romans came in and some being be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And Christ, he prophesied that in Luke chapter 30, 13, verse 35. This is a prophecy of what's going to happen in 70 AD. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come. And you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He was prophesying about 70 AD when he said this. It's not about demons. It's not about whatever false teachings they're talking about. It was him prophesying, saying, Your house is left unto you desolate. Verily I say unto you that you shall not see me until the time. And when that time comes, he's going to say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When he comes back, it's not going to be a pretty picture. It's not. He's coming back to make war. He's not coming back to, you know, be the Jesus like everybody sees. <coughs> That's like another thing, like, with that whole rapture teaching. Yeah. It just makes it seem like God is going to come and just lift us up. And right. we're going, like, ignoring, like, the wrath that he's really going to. On the earth. Right. And there's not one scripture that says that. If you discern the scriptures about how they influence the rapture doctrine, do the research yourself. You'll find out that that's not even what he's talking about. As long as the temple stood, it signified the continuing of the old covenant. So as long as that temple stood in its place, then we were all under the old covenant. That old covenant had to be removed. That old covenant wasn't working. Let's get Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 and 9. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holies of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, mm -hmm. with verse 9, which was a figure for the time, then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. What is that saying? That's basically saying that there was no man who could remove the veil. No man. No man was perfect to move the veil until Christ came along. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way unto the holies, holiest of all was not yet made manifest. So Christ hadn't died on the cross. Why, this is why the first tabernacle was standing. So this, the, the, uh, verse 8 actually is explaining it. There was no way to enter into the holies of holies because the first tabernacle, Solomon's temple, was still there, which was a figure for the time then present. So the old covenant was for back then, not for now, which was offered by both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him, the person who did the service, the high priest, perfect. It couldn't make the high priest perfect. So, the, the gifts and sacrifices are the sacrifices that they had to do when they were entering in the Holy Bible, into the Holy of Holies. So the scripture is basically saying that the high priest did not have the capabilities of making everything holy. And so that blows that whole thing out of the water with uh, Catholicism. You have to go to the priest, the father, and ask for forgiveness of your sins. And they say like ten Hail Marys and whatever yeah. else. Yeah. Catholics will run away from this scripture if they actually if people knew what it meant. 
See, a lot of people who just read the Bible have no clue on what they're reading. But you have to break down precept upon precept. I love that scripture in Isaiah. Another, just rip, just, just rip. Christ just ripped that thing open. Great. Going back. And there is the Ark of the Covenant. Do y'all know what the Ark of the Covenant is? If not, we may have to follow up with the teaching yeah. next week. Isn't it? It's like the covenant that was made. The Ten Commandments was in the Ark of the Covenant. There was a few other items in the Ark of the Covenant. The rod. Which, uh, Aaron's rod. Oh, yeah. And there was a few other things. Ten Commandments? Wasn't that the one that Who? The rod? The rod? No, the rod was, that was Aaron's staff that was in the Ark of the Covenant. She said, was it the one that Moses had? Yeah. That Moses was No. Had. In the Ark of the Covenant is the rod that Aaron, the staff that Aaron had. Also, the Ten Commandments. And there's a couple other items that are in there. The um, angel food. Yeah, the manna. The manna. That's in the Ark of the Covenant, and I believe the... Um, some kind of oil in there. Yeah, some kind of oil. Maybe I'll oil. We don't have to get into the Ark of the Covenant. So where is it now? <coughs> no one really knows where it's at. Some people feel that it's in... Um, Africa. Africa. They think they have it, but the most I know where it's at. Right. Because... Think about that once we go to the wilderness, right? Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Most high is going to reveal where it's at. Mary says the veil was symbolic of Christ himself as the only way to the Father. This is indicated by the fact that the Most High, that the High Priest had to enter in the Holies of Holies through the veil. Now Christ is superior, is our superior High Priest. And as believers in his finished work, we partake of his better priesthood. We can now enter into in the Holy of Holies through him. Says that the faithful enter into the sanctuary by Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. Amen. Having the four brethren boldness to enter into the holies by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and a living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Veil is his flesh. So when Yeshua comes back, mm -hmm. he's going to be uh, the high priest and the king, which is called, I can't say that word, you say it. Mashiach. Mashiach. Uh-uh. Melchizedek. Oh, Melchizedek. That's yeah, good. That means high priest and king. Right. Mashiach is the Hebrew word for Messiah. Messiah. Christ. Here, we see an image of the Shias. Okay, here we see an image of the Shia's flesh being torn for us just as he's tearing the veil for us. Same thing. The veil being torn, pulled apart from top to bottom is in fact of history. Profound significance of this is explained in glorious detail in Hebrews. The things of the temple are were, sh were shadows of the things to come. And they ultimately point us to the shadow. He was the veil to the Holy of Holies through his death. The now faithful, faithful, we now have free, we now have free access to the Most High. The veil in the temple was constant reminder that sin renders humanity unfit for the presence of the Most High. The fact that sin, that the sin offering was offered annually and countless other sacrifices were repeated daily showed graphically that sin could not be truly atoned for by mere animal sacrifices. So, 
when they would atone for sin, that was once a year. If you atone for anything else, you can cut a turtle dove and atone for whatever sin that was. Okay. You stole something, then you know you, you do your little sacrifice, but the majority but the but sin itself you have to be able to differentiate between the two. Sin itself was atoned on one day a year. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. Seeing, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens and shy of the Son of the Most High, Ahiah, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's right. So what this is saying is that there's no more high priests. There's no more prophets. There's no more anything. Christ was the last one. That's what it's saying. Because here's the thing. Let's see, verse 14, seeing that we have a great high priest, which is Christ, that is passed into the heavens. He went into the heavens. Mishiah, the son of the Most High, the higher, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our firmness. So basically, He's not going to change his ways because you feel feeling that or you're full of sin. He's not going to change. See, a high priest, an earthly high priest, he will change. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. You know, you, you'll be fine. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Christ is going to tell you, go and sin no more. He's not going to be worked about your, he doesn't care about you feeling bad about somebody not liking you because you're wearing the type of clothes that you wear. Christ could give a care about that. And you feel bad and you feel like you're being done wrong. Don't care about that. He wants your salvation. He wants you to come to Father but was in all points tempted like we are. He's talking about in all points he was still tempted. Last. The devil tempted him yeah. a few times, not just the three times, but he was tempted in the garden. He was tempted on the mountain. He was tempted everywhere. Every day like we are. And some people would say, <laughs> Well, because they believe in the virgin birth. He wasn't like us. He was God. No, he's not. He was not God, and he's not God. No, he was every big flesh, just like we did. And he, the same things we get tempted with, he got, he got tempted, tempted with. with. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace. He's done that. We have to do it. And so he was tempted and did not sin. So we can't say, oh, I was tempted, but I just couldn't help it. He don't care about you can't go, oh, I right. couldn't help it. I can't help it get you, I never knew you. That's right. So you can't say, oh, you know. Mm -mm, so here that. you go. The ark, the veil being ripped. You see the most high's hands. <laughs> a new living way through the word. That's the old covenant being ripped. It is finished. That's what Yeshua mm -hmm. said on the cross. And there at the bottom it says earthly sanctuary. And there's a Hebrew Israelite rejoicing. Alright, to wrap this up, when Yeshua died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, <coughs> the heavy curtain was torn from top to bottom. It was not ripped from bottom to top as you thought a man would be ripping it. Instead, it was ripped from top to bottom. That's key. 
because if it was almost 60 feet tall, how can a man rip it if it's going from top to bottom? It was the most high rip. If a man was strong enough to rip it, he would be at the bottom and he would be ripping it from the top. That's how you know it was five. The Most High was saying, you no longer are on the outside. You can come in, my son, daughter. I mean, my son has made a way for you. Christ has made a way for us. And that is the ripping of the baby. 